Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Well, I thought we all had another nice weekend, guys, on a visit to Alton, Illinois. Yay, it's yes. so much fun. I love Alton. Yes. Our- it was totally worth the numerous hours on the road, and we even drove through a pretty wicked storm on the way there. It was. It, that was that was some hellish kind of weather. And so, <laughs> Wendy, this is our third uh, visit to the Haunted America convention, which is put on by Troy Taylor. Uh, who's an incredible paranormal writer, ghost writer, haunted history writer out of the St. Louis area. And he's centered at Alton, Illinois, uh, where we've yeah. done a live podcast before and, and been down there before. Now, Allison, how many times have you haunted America down there? <sighs> I don't even know. Um, for a while, I was in Decatur, Illinois, and I uh, went a couple years there. I, I think I started going to Alton back in uh, the early 2000s, the early right. aughts. Uh, and, uh, yeah, wow. I don't know how many times I've been there, but, um, you know, certainly, um, uh, Troy Taylor is an awesome historian and he's been very helpful to me as I, um, go through my, um, work as a historian and, um, as I was, uh, developing the first haunted history tour in Milwaukee, uh, he was, he was a great sounding board and, uh, yeah, so it was great to see him again. And Allison, your Haunted America punch card must be full now so you get a freebie, right? <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's the Pizza Hut buffet of conventions. There you go. Um, so Wendy and I kicked off the entire ceremony. They kicked off the entire party at five o'clock on Friday. Went in there, we played our See You on the Other Side songs uh, for everybody. And that, yeah. that was a lot of fun to play music for them and for new people to hear the band that yeah. hadn't heard us before. Yeah, we warmed up the room for everybody. <laughs> yeah. As they were filing in to hear the opening speech from Troy. And we met a ton of new people. So if you're a new listener that we met this weekend, welcome and hello. And thanks for uh, tuning in. And it was great meeting you. Absolutely. It was great meeting you. And it's, it's just, it's wonderful uh, that we can get to these events and meet some of the people who have heard the podcast also in person and then meet new people and introduce them to our strange world. Yes. And Friday night, Allison also had a big part in the festivities. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I I was just asked uh, impromptu to, to come up and speak by Troy Taylor about the recent uh, Chicago Mothman sightings and my findings. So that was really Your fun. Your buddy, the Mothman. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, to, it's always a great opportunity to talk to people about critical thinking in this field. And then I also... Um, Tobias Wayland, our friend from uh, the Singular Fordian blog, was there, and I invited him up yeah. to talk about his work with the Chicago Phantom Task Force as well. So uh, that was really, really a fun opportunity for me, and a lot of people had a lot of great questions. And so, and that's what I re- really wanted to do: is open it up to to uh, people uh, so that they they could think about like where does paranormal entertainment end and paranormal investigation begin? That was the big question uh, that I started out the weekend with for everyone, and they were really receptive. And that's a hot topic in this field. So congratulations, Allison, on that, bringing that to everybody's attention and getting the discussion going. It's important. Yeah. And it was really fun, too, this, this whole weekend, like just meeting people and getting new stories. Uh, I got a, a few new uh, Mothman reports, um, not from Chicagoland, but from other areas of the country. So that was interesting. And He's everywhere. Uh, yeah. So it was, I shouldn't say Mothman. It, I should just say flying humanoid because one of the reported creatures was actually pink in color, Ooh. which I hadn't heard of before. But again, it was really uh, something compelling because it, it was something that, you know, this this witness doesn't doesn't really talk about because, you know, when you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden this this uh, winged humanoid, you know, just just uh, just a little paler than uh, bismuth, you know, Pepto Bismol, leaps across the road and does a Superman. I mean, what are you supposed to do with that? Wow. 
So right. that was I one of do. yeah one of the new accounts uh, that I received this weekend, and, and it was really really a thrill to meet people who are fans of the show and just fun and eerie too to hear yourself like <laughs> quoted by people. <laughs> Well, my Yay. my problem is that once I get around everybody and everybody starts telling their paranormal stories, I start getting susceptible in the meaning that, you know, everybody had stories <laughs> about attachments. And oh, we, that's right. We had the attachment to the van. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on, on the way down, we've been talking about stories about attachments. And, and yeah. okay, so what the attachments, the idea that a spirit like jumps on board and you're feeling follows kind of, you home. Yeah, follows you home and makes you feel whatever you know you want it to feel, and that to me is always like, give me a break. You know, I just don't. I I understand the concept behind it, but I just don't think it could happen to me, except uh oh, except since we got back. So Saturday night it starts out Saturday night. We're having a really nice time in the hotel bar and had a, had a great time at dinner with everybody, and it was just a wonderful <laughs> time. But then I like lose my phone or get stolen on on Saturday night. So that's the first thing. I'm like, okay. Well, that sucks and bad luck and happens to everybody at some point. But ever since the weekend, all the mechanical stuff has been failing. Like my usual, like my microphone stopped working today. Uh, I, I lost work that I've been working on on the song for this week. You know, I couldn't get the, the MIDI working on the keyboard on the way in. And I'm like, what's happening that everything is malfunctioning at once? It's not just one thing where you're like, oh, I'll go get that fixed. It's like uh, somebody dropped in and just broke all my crap when I got back from the weekend. Aww, well, well, did you smudge or anything, Mike? No, but we were smudging right in the room, remember? I, we I know, but you're home now. I, I am. And, and what about you could put out a dish of vinegar if that's all you got? That's Well, then I'm, put, I'm putting out a dish of I'm in a rehearsal oh. space right now recording in a little studio. And so I am going to... Put out a dish of vinegar as soon as I get home. <laughs> Put some salt around it too. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, the like point. A, make a, a, a salt circle around yourself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because I need my computer stuff to work again. Uh, and I'm be really, salty. Yeah. Because that's. I mean, that is where all of my work is. Like. Anyway, it's just a funny thing. The funny right. Right. Because it, normally I just be like, oh, I'm just having bad luck today. But because of our discussions, because all the people you meet and you have this conversation and everything, I'm like. Do I have a gin on my back? <laughs> oh, no. Is there a gin on my back? But every, you know that keeps on plugging maybe, stuff. Maybe it rode home with us like Teen Wolf style on the roof of the van. <laughs> Cars, <laughs> car surfing. <laughs> oh, styles. Anything's anyway. possible. It is. I, possible. I love that visualization. That's great. <laughs> just holding on, <laughs> surfing yeah, well, away. A lot of these things, you know, are just so vague. But then, you know, when these coincidences start to add up, you know, then you then you ask yourself, hey, what what is going on? Could there be something going on? I, I mean, a lot of this stuff is subtle, and you know, to the point where people are gonna think you're crazy if you even bring it up. But you know, you know, Mike, that. That I had, you know, my own run in with, um, you know, paranormal shutdown uh, on equipment when I, I went to give a presentation and I had a brand new projector and it had worked the night before just fine because you were with me, Mike, testing yep. it out. And then the minute I got there and turned it on, it looked like it was going to work. And then it just switched uh, off repeatedly. Uh... And, uh, there was no. I had to go on. I did not want to go on without a projector, but I had to go on oh, because wow. I would turn it on and it would stand for like thirty seconds and then go off, and again and again and again. And Mike is like, "Is it overheating? No, it was cold. We had it. We had it in the trunk. It's an uh, attachment. Yeah, I I don't know, uh, but yeah, I have my have my suspicions. But um, you know, as soon as I got home. Hey, that thing fired up just fine. <laughs> well, what I think is funny here, you know, we're talking about, and we're making joking a little bit about smudging and putting um, putting bowl of vinegar out with, with salt around it. But I think it's directly- I'm absolutely serious. It was directly, uh, directly related to our podcast today because uh, we're talking- <laughs> oh, no. uh, And the, the, reason, the reason I say that is because we're going to be discussing ceremonial magic and- the idea that each part of the ceremony is integral to the process, and that's part of what we discussed in our conversation on real magic, on, on his book, Real Magic, with, with Dean Radin, Dr. Dean Radin. 
And so that idea of a ceremonial magic and the things you do, whether it's smudging and your belief in what you put into it is what you get out. And we're talking about um, ceremonies must be followed meticulously. You know, each little piece uh, is followed meticulously. And, and what else has to be like that uh, is rocket science. You know, because yeah. every, every, little, every little bit of rocket science, if you don't pour the right chemical into the right chemical, then things go kablooey. <laughs> and so do you. <laughs> right, and so do you. And so that's, so that's what we're talking about today when we're talking about ceremonial magic. Talking about kablooey. And the, I mean, and the relationship between rocket science and ceremonial magic today sounds kind of silly. But this month, a new drama called Strange Angel premiered on CBS All Access. And it follows the tragically strange destiny of Jack Parsons, the original rocket scientist. Parsons was also a practitioner of the dark arts. So we're looking into the truth versus the fiction of this very unique character who not only helped found the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that has sent you know rockets to Mars, um, he also was a ceremonial magician. So that's what we're going to talk about today when we're talking about Strange Angel and the new TV show. Um, first of all, CBS All Access. I find the only shows I watch on that are Star Trek Discovery or Strange Angel. Not even interested in any of the rest. I'm like, <laughs> give me, give me science fiction or give me weird. But I know, I'm, right? <laughs> I like the guy that plays Sherlock Holmes in Elementary, and even then, I'm like, eh, not weird enough. Yeah, but they went pretty big with the sci-fi that they do have. So yeah, got to be thankful uh, yeah. for that. <laughs> yes, they do. They do. And I'm, I'm, and I'm enjoying it. And we're only two episodes in A Strange Angel. But it is something very interesting. And the story of Jack Parsons is woefully underreported. Yeah. And I think the, the thing, too, about listening to this podcast is it'll really help you to understand some of the things that are going on in the show. If you're familiar yeah. with uh, Aleister Crowley and, you know, ceremonial magic, then, you know, a lot of the things that happen in in the in the uh, episodes, I have a lot more impact. But if you don't know what's going on, I, you know, I think it, it could fall kind of flat for some people. Right. And so that's kind of help you out today. It's a little primer to the strange angel. Uh, and first of all, let's talk a little bit about the history of Jack Parsons, shall we? Yeah. So he was born in uh, 1914. And uh, his original name, who's named after his father, Marvel Whiteside Parsons. But then after uh, his mother uh, got a divorce from um, Marvel Parsons Sr., uh, he became known as John or Jack. And he was one of the, uh, you know, one of the really early pioneers of American rocket science. And that's something that I think the show really brings out well, is how people really thought that rocket science was just make-believe and you know there, there are people in the in the series that are, are constantly putting jack down uh you know for being unrealistic and you know wanting to be buck rogers or something like that and you know he really believed that with this technology we could go to the moon and he was absolutely right that's right, the thing we about it the moon. oh yeah yeah and and he uh, we take that for granted now you yeah. know the idea right. that like it's fifty years ago. Yeah, we really take it for granted now. That and that's the that's a wonderful part of the series is that it takes you back in time to what it might have been like before that kind of propulsion was available, and you know how uh, small minded people can be, and and really when you think about Jack Parsons, we're going to talk about a lot of crazy sounding stuff today, but he was really a forward thinker. Uh, he thought of some frightening things, too, um, which will relate. But it, it's just amazing um, how much of a futurist he was and, and how people really uh, gave him a hard time for that. And this isn't really new either, the idea that someone who could be so uh, steeped in science could also be really into uh, magic and, and paranormal stuff. You know, like today, that idea... If you had a professor at the university, let's say your chemistry professor, also dabbled in Crowley and Thelema, you'd be like, uh, you know, they would, they'd, um, you know, they'd take away his tenure. 
<laughs> right? They'd right. be like, get, the, get this guy out, get this nonsense guy out of here. But this isn't even new because... Um, we talk about Isaac Newton. He wrote yeah. just as much about alchemy and uh, trying to turn lead into gold as he did about physics. He invented physics, and he also was trying to turn lead into gold. Yeah. I mean, alchemy was one of his lifetime pursuits. I mean, he was really, really serious. And that's something uh, that wasn't known uh, up until recently when when someone you know found um, all his his writings and his library and all this evidence uh, that really showed what a first class freak he was. And, you know, when we talk about Newtonian physics, we're talking about a hundred percent alchemist. Right. But what's interesting about that though, is we were also discussing the relationship between things like ceremonial magic and rocket science. In a lot of ways, they require the same type of thinking. And precision. Um, And so that's kind of where we're going um, with this discussion, because Jack Parsons is a guy who brought that out in all of his work. So it wasn't just his rocket science where he did that. It was also in other parts of his life. And, and Isaac Newton was the exact same way. And so the fact is, we act like all this stuff is unrelated. But even, right. the, the, even the psychological aspects of it, of w- when you're looking at how you would perform a ritual, and the idea that every step of the ritual in a ceremony is important, just like every step in the scientific process when you're developing something is important. Yeah, and and I think too that uh, we should recognize also that chemistry actually owes its founding to the proto-science of alchemy. And that's something that isn't usually recognized, but it really should right. be. And, and on what you're saying, Mike, is that these things aren't diametrically opposed like we are taught. You know, science and magic can work hand in hand. Well, and, and so let's get a little bit to the history. So, I mean, Jack Parsons lived in California his entire life. Yep. And so born in 1914, in October of 1914. First of all, that's only 104 years ago, but it might as well be a thousand. <laughs> when I think about 1914, I'm like, holy right. crap. That, that's a long time ago. But you can see modern pictures of him. And when you see a picture of Jack Parsons... It looks like, I mean, he's got a goatee and stuff, and he's got curly hair and the outfits he wears. He doesn't. He look was a handsome out. devil. He was. I, I think that was one thing, though, about the TV show that I think is a little uh, off in that. You don't think he's handsome? Well, no, it's not that I don't think he's handsome in the show, but they kind of make him a Chris Pine type. The actor that. Chris oh, Pine Chris the, Pine is hideous. Well, right, that's not what I mean. <laughs> But I think they make him more of an uber-masculine type in the TV show, where in real life, when you read about Jack Parsons, they talk about him as he's kind of effeminate. Hmm. They, you know, and they also, one of the things in the TV show when he's talking about his friend, uh, Frank, who he's doing the research with. Yeah, he's he kind sa- of the Egon Spangler of the show. Yeah, so they make him like, they make him like, nerd <laughs> alert. Totally nerdy. You know, that kind of thing, you know. But also in, in the show, he says, like, yes, remember yeah. what I did to the bullies or whatever. It makes it act like he defended the nerd guy against the oh, bullies. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, he's a big tough guy. When I think I was reading that it actually was the other guy that was defending Jack against the bullies. Really? Oh. So, so you can see the Hollywood character the in twist. there in, in that, you know, he's a, he's a renegade that doesn't play by the rules. <laughs> and, right. And, yeah. he, and he's going to defend Nerdy Bob or whatever or Nerdy Ned. Uh, in in this whole thing, like, and so he's the defender of the nerds and he's brash and he says things when it's talking to the college professors in the second episode, particularly you'll notice he enters a classroom and has a mano y mano debate with one of the professors. Right. It's a slow clap moment. I feel, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know, but that's a cool part too, because the professor writes this equation on the board and instead of seeing the equation, Jack sees the symbol of the Lima. Well, he sees a sigil. And okay. uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Is, is it, this, is it a, a sigil from the Lima? I'm not sure. Well, the unicursal hexagram, which looks like kind of like a Star of David, except the sides are smaller. So we can put that in the show notes so you can see what the sigil is. But the unicursal hexagram kind of look, you know, six, six. So it's kind of like the Star of David, except the Star of David, everything's equal, like all the parts oh, of it. Yeah. And this mm-hmm. is where. The, uh, the vertical sections of it are longer and the horizontal sections are shorter. And so that is a, that is a main symbol in Thelema. 
Oh, great. And and could you explain what Thelema is? And then we got to talk about sigils and what they okay. are. Okay. So the guy that developed Thelema is our man, Uncle Al, Alistair Crowley. <laughs> Holy moly. And so he really developed- The great beast. The great beast himself. Uh, he really developed it in the early 20th century. And he'd write about it, and, and he thought he was this prophet of the new age. And he had these spiritual experiences in Egypt that this- uh, he called him a preter human, like a, a, a someone before human, maybe even right. non-corporeal, like a spirit entity visits him from before the age of humans, and the being called itself Iwas, and it contacted him and dictated a text known as the Book of the Law, or right, Liber and that comes Al into, Religious. Yeah, that the Book of the Law comes in a lot in the first two episodes, and that's I mean in the first episode, you know, Jack finds himself getting into a, a Thelemic kind of meeting, right? Yeah. Like he, he sees what looks like a, it's a classic Hollywood human sacrifice moment. But, you know, it, what it made <laughs> yeah. me think, it made me think of the ending of Young Sherlock Holmes. You guys remember Young Sherlock Holmes? Oh, yeah. I love that movie. So it really made me think about Young Sherlock Holmes, uh, that whole scene where he stumbles upon uh, the human sacrifice, or what he thinks of as a human sacrifice. So that's, uh, a little bit, this, this ceremonial magic that Alastair Crowley was part of, where you would go through these ceremonies to try to get more power uh, for yourself. So the book of the law, the, the, the only law, it says, do what thou wilt, and that shall be the whole of the law, right? Is the, that, that is the basic message of it. So the basic right. message of is that you need to do what makes you feel good and you need to will that into existence. And the, yeah. one of the ways you will things into existence is magic with a K. Right, right, right. So, so let's, um, let's delve into that a little bit deeper because in the series, the, this neighbor moves in and he's like the exposition machine of the series because he's drawing uh, Jack Parsons into this uh, shadowy world of the Lima. And he espouses do what thou wilt in kind of a hedonistic way, which, you know, a lot of uh, Crowley scholars would argue isn't really the way that it was meant, that really it was meant more as, you know, not just do whatever you want, right. but do what thou wilt, you know, live by your will and will what you want into existence. And uh, interestingly, like thematically, I mean, this is what Jack Parsons really needs to do uh, because he's trying to convince people that rocketry is the future, and they're all luddites and don't think it's possible, right? Of course not. Yeah, and and uh, he's got to bring uh, the naysayers screaming into the future, and so his will is is really important for him as a character, and that was uh you know the driving force of the Lima. There's another part where um this sigil is stabbed into their front door uh, with a dagger, a ceremonial dagger. And uh, Jack Parsons' wife, uh, you know, finds, you know, why can't this ever happen to me? You know, I just go home, everything's normal. But she goes home and she finds a dagger stabbed into the door with, with some it. cryptic message like symbol uh, on attached it. to it. Yeah, and so she opens it up and then it, it's, you know, a sigil and it has 93 in the middle. So we should explain what a sigil is and what 93 is. So a sigil, as I understand it, is, um, as you were explaining earlier about when Jack, in the second episode, he's sitting in the um, the lecture hall and the uh, embattled professor is chalking up a formula on the board to prove why rocketry can't work. And instead, right. Jack sees a sigil. And uh, so a sigil is just a, a geometric representation of something that you want, something that you are trying to will uh, into existence. And uh, so when you are enmeshed in magical practice, what you try to do is come up with a symbol that is representative of your desire. So... It's kind of like graphic art in the way you're trying to make a logo for your, your magical practice. And so you make this uh, and then you can focus on it. And 
and uh, through you know certain practices, you can put your energy into it, and that that's what a sigil is. Now, ninety three is uh, interesting because it is something that um, Thelemites, uh, followers of Aleister Crowley, um, when they meet each other, they will often greet each other just with the numbers 93. And uh, when you see it on the door, on, on the message that was on the door, uh, you know, the I mean, Jack and his wife are like really freaked out. Like, what does it mean? Right. And like, they think really, it's like, are we going to be the 93rd victim? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was so funny <laughs> that they called the police and, <laughs> and they thought they were going to be the 93rd victims. That was great. And uh, what it really means is it means will, the Lima, and agape, love, which are the two primary tenets of uh, the Lima. And remember Alistair Crowley now, even though he was married and stuff, and this gets into the show too and to the life of Jack Parsons. Right. Thelemites are very free loving. Like they're yes. like they're like it's so when they say love and will, it's love who you will. You know, if you can't what's that great would you think of <laughs> would you think of Graham Parsons as as a oh who who did that song? If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Yeah. Um what wasn't it um uh, Stephen Stills, sorry. Stephen Stills, thank you. Yeah. Stephen Stills did that if you can't be it. When we talk about a sigil, though, like one one thing to think of is that how many times have some have you heard someone say, "If you want something, write it down." Yes. You know, oh, if yeah. you if you, if you want to accomplish something, if you want any you know anything in your life to uh, to change or something, your goals, write it down. That's exactly what a sigil is. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's not not different than you writing down. Your daily affirmation yeah. in like, I... It's a way of drawing your <laughs> focus to, to the thing. Yeah, your daily affirmation. What was that that Stuart Smalley said? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that was, that's a form of magic yeah. right there. And, uh, you know, so will and love, the Lima and Agape are represented by the number of 93 because... Um, there's a certain technique where you uh, take the the words and you take their uh, Greek letters and each Greek letter has a numerical value and then you add them up and the sum of both Thelema and Agape is 93. So Thelema is 93 and Agape is 93. So when they write 93, they are essentially just saying uh, love is the law, love under will. That's all that note is supposed to say. But what's really funny about that, too, when I think about it, is that when we talk about numbers getting together and adding them up, um, people are looking for that kind of symbolism all the time in different things. Like, I remember when I was a kid reading in a newspaper when we spent that summer in Berkeley, Allison, somebody in the newspaper had written in some kind of letter to the editor of the Berkeley Telegraph, whatever the newspaper is. And it's, what did it say? It said, like, well, Ronald Reagan is the Antichrist because, and you can tell because you add his his first his first name as six letters. Ronald Wilson his second name as six letters. Reagan his last name as six letters. Obviously, that's a symbol for six six six. Yes, the Antichrist. Right, as somebody's writing that in, and you're just thinking, this is hilarious. Obviously, because it's just people looking at any kind of symbolism. And do you think the devil, like if the Antichrist showed up, he'd be like, you know what? I'm gonna put subtle hints. Everywhere, <laughs> so people know I'm the devil. Like, if I'm going to take right. over the world, I'm going to do it with like with hidden style, right? And I think too, you know, numerology works on that basis too of of you know reducing things to numbers, and you know that's all ninety three is. It's just like shorthand for that tenant of uh, Thelema. Right. If you ever listen to isn't her name Glennis McCants or whatever on Coast to yeah, Coast? Yeah, that's like right. she's. That's exactly the same kind of thing that she talks about all the time when she's talking to George Norrie. And he's yep, like, well, what, what, do you, what do you think is going to happen in the Middle East? And she's like, well, looking at the numbers adding up um, is, this, is the exact same kind of thing that we're talking about with this communication in Talima. So what's also funny is that all this stuff is coming from Alistair Crowley. All this stuff that we're talking about in the 21st century is stuff that these guys were working on in the early 20th uh, and the beginning of the uh, and, uh, 1900s. And I think that's yeah. pretty funny and interesting, too, because you kind of wonder where all it came from. And, and people called Alistair Crowley the wickedest man in the world. 
but we're still, his influence is still felt today. Yeah, hugely. And uh, I think too that people kind of misunderstand what he was trying to do in a way. I don't know. It's really hard. The more reading you do, you know, sometimes it seems the more confused you get. But Aleister Crowley and uh, his uh, religious beliefs could be seen under uh, the the umbrella of gnosis uh, or like being a Gnostic church, a Gnostic religious belief. And essentially Gnosticism, it's not saying, hey, you know, we love to be evil or anything like that. It's saying that everything that you know that comes to you, like the Catholic church, for example, that comes to you and presents itself as something that that's good and uh, forthright is really the opposite. So the Gnostic church turns everything on its head and makes you question everything um, as to, you know, who really are uh, the people with the white hats and who are the black hats. It, it totally inverts everything. But it's not essentially saying, hey, be evil. But, you know, some of the stuff we're going to talk about, you know, seems to be going that way. And, you know, Aleister Crowley himself liked to parade around and call himself the great beast and, you know, go by that number 666. Uh, But that may have been, you know, a a way to just appear as, you know, kind of that classic bad boy that the media loves and continue getting that attention that that he uh, relished. Well, absolutely. I mean, everybody from Motley Crue used to dress up in like, pentagrams and things like that and they had all this occult in their in their album shout at the devil it it's made up to look like a satanic yeah. temple with all of them in it. do you think tommy lee really worships the devil no i mean tommy lee here's a guy into free love but like do you think he really cares about the devil or any kind of religious stuff no they're just trying to shock people and get them interested and sell sell cds and right. so a- alistair crowley used that he used those things in his way to further this idea of Thelema and, and the Book of the Law and, and things like that. Now, let's, let's keep talking a little bit about Alistair, but let's also talk about the rocket science part. And I know we, we seem to, the, the TV show really goes into them working with other rocket scientists, how they were kind of on the outside of the university system. But here's a great quote you found, Allison, from yeah. Werner von Braun, who we always think, you know, Werner von Braun uh, is, well, <laughs> Father of rocketry, but really he was a, a Nazi brought up over here by Operation Paperclip. <laughs> and he himself <laughs> Just claimed... to put it mildly. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly right. I mean, the man that developed the V-2 rockets that they launched from mainland Europe over to England during the Blitz, that's Werner von Braun. And then we brought him over because we wanted to beat the Soviets to the moon. So we're like, yep. okay, you did do some stuff. We fought against you in the war and stuff like that, but... That was the, the past is the past and the Soviets yeah. are the future and we got to get to the moon first. He himself said it was the self-taught Parsons, not himself, who is the true father of the American space program for his contribution to the development of solid rocket fuel. So, I mean, we wouldn't have gotten to the moon without Jack Parsons. And he, he made it possible. He, he took something that everybody, nearly everybody thought was impossible and he made it happen. Now that sounds that like is magic the definition to me. Of magic. Yeah, that is the definition of magic right there. And, um, you know, before we go on, just let's get a couple of other definitions out right quick. Um, so ceremonial magic uh, essentially is, so now here's here's where it gets devilish, is Ew. the entrapment of demons to bend them to your will. So, you know, it's not just, there, there's um, a lot of magical practices that, you know, have certain steps and recipes, uh, but ceremonial magic in particular is about summoning demons to do your bidding. And uh, so... That's like, that's something that mom it, definitely wouldn't go for. If like no. I said like, hey mom, like I'm going to summon a demon to the room uh, so I can get a good grade on this report. She'd be yeah. like, no, you're going to study and not be summoning. Like that would be offensive to her very Right. Nature. To be fair, if you did it, you would deserve a good grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that is correct. I, I mean, I mean, that would get the gold medal at the science fair, don't <laughs> exactly. you think? Exactly. Who's yeah. going to deny? It, it's like, uh. hey, your, uh, your baking soda volcano is really sweet. <laughs> I've got ball over here. Yeah. Like, I've got them in a little cage. I've got coming out of the volcano, baby. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I got, I got, I got Pele <laughs> popping her head out. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, that's what ceremonial magic is. Uh, and also um, the church that Aleister Crowley founded is known as the OTO. That's the or- Ordo. Ah, I have a hard time pronouncing this one. That's why people just say OTO. It's the or- Ordo. Sorry. Ordo. Ordo Templi Orientis. Oh, man. Makes and, me you study. Know, real and quick. stutter. I, um, <laughs> I think it's funny that they use the word Orientis in there. And so much of this stuff is based on Egyptian. Um, a lot of it's Indian. It's, there's a very uh, aspect of the Orient in a lot of what Alistair Crowley does, the Middle East, the, 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 the things that were popular in the early 20th century. Like we've talked about before on our haunted Hollywood travelogue, how the Egyptian theater, the Oriental theater, they're named after these places that people had a fascination with. The entire yeah. Howard, Howard Carter and Egyptology. Um, yep. That, and that, Dracula. All, all manifestations um, of this Orientalism, the mysterious East. Well, and they do that. They did it because it sold stuff and it got people interested. So Alistair Crowley got people excited about his thing by uh, Madame Blavatsky had the same thing. Like half of her yeah. stuff is about the mysterious East and her travels through dark Calcutta and, you know, stuff Absolutely. like that. So the black hole of Calcutta, like all these things, these, these mysterious places on the other side of the universe or the other side of the planet um, were used in marketing. It's to get people excited about things. And Alistair Crowley, if we knew he was good at one thing, it was marketing, and he brought Jack Parsons in. So in the outline, we talk about this, and this happens in the, in the TV show, too, in the second episode, you see a little bit of this. But uh, did Jack Parsons really summon the devil at age 13? What do you guys think? Yeah. Well, and, and that, that, that is, um, that is in, you know, the beauty of it is that is in the second episode where the neighbor somehow knows about Jack's dark secrets that as a child he was trying to summon the devil. And no one told him that. How did he know? Magic. Right. So, and, and that really, um, he, he did um, in his writings, um, Jack, Jack Parsons has a lot of magical writings, um, and he... Uh, claimed that that he summoned the devil at age 13. And that's something that's kind of reflected in the series in the second episode that shows, you know, Jack as a child. You know, the first episode was kind of like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm a maverick. I'm a maverick man's man uh, who lives by my own rules. But hey, what's this weird magic stuff? Like he didn't have anything to do with it. Like he's a lamb to the slaughter. And now, you know, we're starting to see, oh no. himself as a wee little Satanist. He he knows what's up. He knows what's up. (laughs) And, and, you know, so that's a great scene in the second episode where he's on the floor with candles all around, drawing the sigil, and then... His father, in this like eyes wide shut type, you know, monster mask, is in the doorway, tilting his head, looking at his boy fondly or something. We don't really know because he's behind the mask. But um, right. you know, a lot, a lot of people who um, are interested in Jack Parsons are also interested in what the heck was going on with Marvel Parsons, um, and hope that one day a book will be written about Jack's dad because apparently he worked for um, the Woodrow Wilson administration. So he, he was in the government and uh, had kind of a shadowy past himself. So Well, then uh, he got kicked out of the house by Jack's mom because he kept on visiting yeah. prostitutes and she's like, and that, that was it. He never got to have a relationship with his son after that. Right. Um, and, and they and even s- changed Jack's name. You know, they Marvel. changed, uh, they t- struck Marvel off and, Which you know, called really a Jack. shame. So what I think is interesting, though, is that Jack gets into this and he starts corresponding with Alistair Crowley. Like they start ha- writing letters back and forth. And, you know, I wonder if this is going to happen with email. Like, I, I kind of hope not, but I kind of hope it does. That all of these people, you know, the thing about letters and especially with early 20th century uh, and writers, we can, we can tell what their thoughts were on things. We can, we can hear about what we don't hear about through their books. Um, because of all the stuff they wrote to each other about. And I think that's really powerful. You know, there's all the, the Lovecraft circle. You have all the letters between Robert Block and August Derleth and H.P. Lovecraft. And, and then now we have uh, the letters between Jack Parsons and Alistair Crowley. And I don't think in the future we're going to get people's emails uh, like they were able to get emails from each other. And I don't know if that's, yeah. a, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. But so he starts corresponding with Alistair Crowley and... 
they start working and doing these magical experiments in addition to the work he's doing at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So he has the work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is, uh, I mean, obviously becomes even more important during the war because the Nazis have developed rockets. And so the Allies have to, you know, develop rockets too. So JPL becomes even more important during the Second World War. And uh, Jack Parsons is working there. And then at the same time, um, he's also doing these unusual magic ceremonies with the help of Alistair Crowley. Even though Alistair Crowley, like, was making fun of those Americans, you know, to other people, Jack Parsons wasn't just, like, performing magic ceremonies. He wanted to try and bring a moon child into the world. Right. It was called the Babylon Working. It was a magical spell. And who did he bring in to help him? L. L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard. You got to love it. Like so the founder the, of Scientology yeah. and the writer of classics such as Battlefield Earth. Yeah. So hopefully um, the Scientologist won't shut this podcast yeah. down. We love Scientology. <laughs> we're great. Hey, we we're totally. We love Tom Cruise. Yeah, we're, to- um, we're totally clear. Yeah, but L. Ron Hubbard uh, came to uh, Jack Parsons' mansion because, you know, so Jack Parsons started out, and I mean, the series is really doing this well, as, you know, he started out rich, and then the Depression hit, and then he was, like, dirt poor trying to get this um, rocket science thing off the ground. Everybody was telling him no. And then, you know, like you said, the war starts, you know, people start to see that, oh, no, we we need this. Uh, you know, the Nazis are developing rockets. I guess it's not so foolish after all. <laughs> and then, you know, he starts making some money enough that he's able to buy a, a mansion uh, in Pasadena, which becomes known as the Parsonage and is the lightning rod for people uh, in the intelligentsia uh, all over California who come through, including L. Ron Hubbard, who uh, becomes a partner uh, with Jack to do something called the Babylon Working to bring uh, this uh, whore of Babylon energy back into the world and then birth a moon child to uh, bring about a new era. And the new era was supposed, was supposed to be pretty good. Like it was supposed to be a, a happy thing because the moon child is the, uh, Babylon is the opposite of Horus, who to them represented war, was the spirit of Mars, uh, was the spirit of conflict, and yeah. Babylon was the spirit of love. Well, kind of. I mean, the more reading I I do, the more I become troubled because it's not as nice as it sounds because, you know, Jack himself said, you know, that that this this would be a terrible thing wrought on the world. I mean, it was necessary, but uh, what he was really trying to do, according to many of his writings, is to bring about the apocalypse and to do that by bringing, you know, opening up this crack in, in the universe to, you know, let What's this so about that? let this energy in. That that he <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just the apocalypse. It's just goes the Gozerian. Well well right. So he was just trying to bring about the apop- apocalypse <laughs> so that we could get it over with. And just you know, and then after that the good times roll. Uh but yeah, so you know, I don't want to candy coat it, uh, because he did think of this goddess energy that who's bringing in more like the the Indian goddess of Kali that it would uh, destruction it would, it would rot destruction but uh, eventually it would be a good thing I mean because at first I was like oh yeah he's bringing in the goddess he's drawing down the moon it's so nice and and then I was like oh no he thinks he's the antichrist and he's bringing about the apocalypse um so yeah it's it's troubling but at the same time though isn't that we think a lot of uh, we talk about um modern evangelical Christianity and some of their support of Israel. And that thing oh, is because yeah. Israel, Israel has to be around for the rapture to happen, for the end times to come. And I mean, I don't right. know how much of that is just uh, the crap and the usual political stuff that you read versus what people actually hope for and believe. But the thing is, is that this idea that people want to bring about the end of the world so a better world can take place. Um, I mean, that's pretty, you know, That's central to a lot of religions. You know, a lot of early Christians also thought that Jesus was coming back within their lifetime. They're like, he's coming back and he's bringing hell with him. I mean, Johnny Cash sings songs about that when the man comes around. 
um, the righteous yeah. judgment of Jesus is coming. And, and to them, these guys had these guys had the moon child. And right. for, for you Iron Maiden fans, Moon Child is the first song off of Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. And absolutely, the lyrics to Moon Child by Iron Maiden are completely based on Alistair Crowley. You know, I am he, the bornless one, the fallen angel watching you, Babylon, the scarlet whore, I infiltrate your gratitude. Like, that's straight out of uh, Alistair Crowley's writing about the Moon Child that yeah. Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. Now, I don't know if they were big Iron Maiden fans, but if they were cool, they would have been. <laughs> well, here, here's the thing that um, you just brought up the Bornless one, which is really uh, interesting to me because um, when, oh, oh well, I, I'm kind of getting ahead of things here. So um, they did this conjuring L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons to bring in, they wanted this scarlet woman to come into their lives. And that she would be the magical and romantic partner also because, okay, this is sex magic, so we have to have a female element. So they wanted to you have sex. this elemental spirit that they called the Scarlet Woman. And she came to them. She came to the parsonage in the form of the artist uh, named Marjorie Cameron, uh, who had flaming red hair and slanted green eyes. And so uh, they immediately recognized her, and she moved into the parsonage, and they got busy, literally, <laughs> to make the moon child. And, but also, um, it, it wasn't happening. Like, they were doing this Babylon working. They were doing this series of rituals every night. Yeah. And like Jack Parsons, is, he's um, sending letters to Alastair Crowley about it. And talking about how like nothing happens for five days, then one day they see a strange light in the air above them, and he has to use a magical sword to dissipate the light. And he's he's writing about this, and, and we were talking about the Book of the Law, the you know the the original book by Alistair Crowley. Well, Jack Parsons wrote the sequel, right? He writes his own, like the Babylon working becomes the the sequel. He writes to the Book of the Law, and there's all this poetry and stuff in the beginning. And this is funny. This is when I was, my computer was screwing up today. And we have this part of the earlier, I was, you know, work, I was working with different quotes from the, you know, the Jack Parsons Babylon book of the law. And that's when everything started getting messed up. And I'm just like, all right, I'm making Babylon mad. Yeah. And let me just interject that, um, you know, Jack thought that, you know, the Babylon working actually brought, negative consequences to him as well and you mentioned the bornless one that's a specific kind of ritual when marjorie moved in to the parsonage she started to experience a lot of paranormal phenomena uh, and she was really concerned about it and um, so jack stated that the performance of alistair crowley's bornless one ritual was known to cause permanent haunting wherever it was recited so they eventually moved out um of the parsonage because of this psychic phenomena oh wow that's that's something else that's really interesting and yeah um the thing is so it's it's jack it's l ron hubbard (laughs) and it's marjorie the scarlet whore and this is their this first of all it sounds like a sweet place to live they're doing number one. That's <laughs> yeah. science. Well, they had to move on because of all the paranormal stuff. Right, but it's also the gateway to hell. Oh, there's right. that. Oh, there's always a downside, right? <sighs> so um, let's get quickly to the downside then. Uh, so um, they have to move from the parsonage, and oh, we forgot to report that L. Ron Hubbard skipped off with not Marjorie Cameron, but uh, Jack's old girlfriend. And uh, most of Jack's fortune he stole from Jack and uh, ran away on, on a yacht, incidentally. I don't know how you get very far very fast in one of those. As long, as, hey, as long as you can go faster than Jack Parsons can swim, you're fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, but he ran away with, with all of Jack's stuff, and except for Marjorie. And so uh, Jack saw that as a negative manifestation of the Babylon working. And then later he's he's working for Howard Hughes at Hughes Aircraft. And then all of a sudden in, in 1950, he's mysteriously fired and accused of removing confidential documents. And then the FBI actually investigates him for a year. Also, though, Jack, remember at the time, this is the, so the 1950s, and we were talking about the Soviets before. 
So when we start right. talking about the 1950s, we have to remember that this is the beginning of McCarthyism. This is the beginning of the communist witch hunt, right? which was not that different than the Salem witch hunt. And, and so we're getting there. And before Jack was a full-blooded Thelemite, he was a Marxist. And he had dabbled oh, in so- yes, he had, I he forgot had, about that. Yeah, he had dabbled in socialism in the 1920s and the 1930s. It was a big, being a socialist was a big deal for a while, and people got into it and everything. And because, oh, it's the Soviet Union, you don't understand. They don't have poor people anymore. They, they didn't realize that Joseph Stalin was killing a million people every five years and whatnot at the time. And so people were into socialism and communism, and uh, Jack Parsons was one of them. So now, 10 years later, uh, he's working uh, for Hughes Aircraft, which is doing work for the government. And they're going back and they're saying, who here has ever been or associated with socialists? Jack Parson is one of them. So, of course, the FBI is going to check it out. And not only that, he's in a sex call, guys. So he's a commie pervert. Do you want this commie <laughs> pervert working on American security? Is he not completely vulnerable to uh, his whims? Soviet. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so for Jack, this was a representative of all those bills from the Babylon working coming due that that what he wanted was coming into existence, but he also was going to pay for it in his own life. And his final bill uh, <laughs> would come on June 17th, 1952. Do you want to take that mic and tell about what happened to him? Well, just that um, he was working in his garage uh, at the new place that he was living at, not at the parsonage, but he's working in his garage. And then he dropped some mercury fulmate that ended up blowing him up. So he, yeah. I mean, he was hoisted by his own petard. And, and he didn't die immediately oh either. No. He, was, he was literally blown oh in half gosh. and uh, would die later uh, at the hospital. And uh, Marjorie was Oh, I didn't know down, about that part. That's, yeah, Marjorie that's was unpleasant. down the street getting groceries. And uh, she was deeply affected uh, by the tragedy. And she would always maintain that Jack Parsons was murdered in a conspiracy that was engineered by Howard Hughes. Dun, dun, and dun. The, you know, the, the thing um, is that they were preparing to leave the country. That was the night before they were going to leave uh, for Mexico and uh, start a new life. Oh, he was going to make a run for the border and got blown in yeah, half. That sucks. Yeah, he never made it. He never made it. So that that was the... Horrible end, and, and you know, still a mysterious end of Jack Parsons. Was it just a mistake? You know, a lot of people try to point out, oh, that he was a messy scientist and everything like that. But, but hey, he he dealt with these explosive chemicals for years and years. Um, but this time, uh, it would claim his life, and he was only thirty-seven years old. You know, I, I buy this though in a certain way, and I'll tell you why. That he might have just blown himself up. Because how many, you ever know a guy that's a woodworker, like a lifelong woodworker, or a lifelong guy that works with a table saw? (laughs) I've known like three different guys like that, and they're all missing a couple of fingers. True. And so you figure Uh, that- They get too cocky. Yeah. Right. Or if you're going to put your fingers by a table saw that many times, the rules of chance state, you're going to cut one of them off one of these days. And I remember there was like a soccer coach I had when I was like 15 and he'd like, hold up. He's like, all right, we need three guys out there. And only two fingers went up. Oh. And, and it was that kind of thing. And there was another guy. So there was like three different people I know whose job was mainly with a saw and they had missing fingers. So while I, you know, I do think it's fun to think of the idea that it was some kind of red scare revenge or it's Babylon saying, you never made the moon child. Now I'm taking you in. Um, or it's just Alistair Crowley, you know, s- doing something sneaky. You know, that's a, that's a more fun paranormal idea than just him going like, like pouring a little too much and then like, uh oh, and that was his last. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know? right. What yeah, are, it's, you know, what are Jack Parsons' last words? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's it's a more fitting end, but uh, yeah, some people uh, might think though that he did bring in the Babylon working because you know this was the the fifties, and then after the fifties we had the sixties, which many people would argue that there was a goddess element that came into our culture, and uh, certainly there was free love, which uh, Jack would have been all about. He would have approved. 
Yeah, he no, would have definitely approved I, I, of the '60s. He would have. He would have. And we're still paying the bills due from the baby boomers in our society today. But you know, I have never been on any Jack Parsons adventures. But we do have somebody who has been to the dark side of Pasadena, and it's a friend of the podcast. Scott Marcus has been to the dark side of Pasadena, and he himself has done some investigations on Jack Parsons. Scott, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, it's like the sound of Babylon coming in in the middle of the story. (laughs) And and I suppose since the topic is up, I should let you guys know that I am the moon child. Oh, (laughs) see? I knew it. Excellent. Sweet. You know, every time you walk into a room, you should have that Iron Maiden song play. I would. (laughs) In my head, it's going. (laughs) All right. Sweet. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, Pasadena, you know, I happened to live in Los Angeles for a while there. And Pasadena, even before I was uh, digging into the history and and stumbling across the the incredible story that is Jack Parsons, JPL, all around Hubbard, bringing about the Antichrist, all of this, the crazy chaos that is all within one story. Uh, At first blush, Pasadena just looked to me. I, I took a look around and I thought, this is a Tim Burton type of town. It's one of those places like a uh, Edward Scissorhands setting where everything is so nice that it must be evil. <laughs> there has to be some darkness not far below the surface. And then, of course, you know, one of the first things you stumble across is this Jack Parsons story, this, this incredibly dark, weird, twisted tale. And um, I'm telling you, the Arroyo Seco Canyon, which goes about 25 miles uh, it has the big reservoir right at JPL. Uh, JPL uh, is built right alongside one end of the canyon, and the Devil's Gate, where this little cave where some of these practices took place, is just at the other end of the same reservoir. Um, it's a spooky place, <laughs> just in general. Um, mm-hmm. But but in addition to Uh, The JPL stuff, there are cryptid sightings here, there are tales of the Los Angeles dragons, these big winged creatures seen coming out from the Arroyo Canyon area, um, that people, not looking like Mothman, but people think that these are prehistoric uh, pterodactyls that are coming out and feeding on the bats that are flying around at night. Oh my god, maybe one of them is Iwas, or whatever, like the Pritter human. (laughs) Maybe the Babylon working worked. Yeah, I mean, talk about just all kinds of, like, mythological uh, imagery coming out of the space. Not too far from here also is the Colorado Street Bridge, which uh, goes over the Arroyo Seco Canyon, and that is more commonly known as the Suicide Bridge. And it is unfortunately accurately nicknamed that, as there have been over 100 suicides that took place at that location and continue to be uh, happening there at a very regular basis and I don't think there's anything paranormal about that. I think it is like the Golden Gate Bridge, where it just kind of attracts that kind of activity. Those kind of people that they want to end their life, they know that this is a place where people go to do that, and it's effective. And they've put up safety netting and all that kind of stuff, but if somebody really wants to do that final act, it will happen there. But it has led to that location being incredibly haunted, both on the street and in the ravine in the valley below. Lots of entities seen wandering around in those areas. And so before Jack Parsons though, came there, did Pasadena have a reputation? Like, was, was Marvel Parsons, I mean, even though we don't know anything about him, but would he have been drawn there by any particular kind of legends from the 19th century? Or are there any indigenous people legends from that area, too, that might be like, you know, this is a mystical place where we can conjure up the devil? Well, to start, the name Devil's Gate is not a new name. It has been around for a long time, and I think it actually does date back to Native American times, so so, uh, back to antiquity. The name does date back to prehistory because there is a rock formation that is just naturally there that seems like the silhouette of a devil's face, a demon face, the devil himself, and that just happens to be right next to where the cave is, where L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons went and did their rituals. It's right next to it. So the Devil's Gate area is a name that dates back well before modern terminology. And anytime you see a lot of negativity happening over many eras and all different types of negative activity, you wonder, is it coincidence or is there just some something bad in the air there and it's kind of drawing this kind of activity out well now there's smog right 
you know, they're smog. <laughs> that, that bad energy can't go anywhere, so it's just going to hover. <laughs> um, but I know there were legends, uh, Native American legends, uh, due to the fact that the waterfall in the area would kind of echo through the canyon, and it would sound like this odd laughter. And mm. so there were Native American legends that came from that. They weren't necessarily scary stories, but, I mean, when you hear this phantom continual laughing, chuckling down this, uh, at the time, natural area where there is no people, that's got to make your skin crawl a little bit. <laughs> Well, that thing makes me think of uh, one of the lines in Jack Parsons' Book of the Law sequel or whatever. It's that I, I laugh the laugh of the drunken whore in the house of ecstasy. Wow. You would have that, that quote just off the top of your head. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done, Mike. Yeah. And saving it for that moment. But that kind of thing, that, that idea that, you know, that's that strange, weird laughter or whatever, it just struck me for some reason. It's like, oh, laugh the laugh of the drunken whore. All right. Having a good night, Jack? And then it would be echoing into the cave where, where you know, they, they brought the Whore of Babylon. So it's a, uh, th- there's synchronicity there. Like, and you are the moon child. So this all, we're coming full circle here. Yeah. And so the first time I, I visited Devil's Gate Dam, I was freaked out. Like, I, I, I was studying up a little bit, trying to learn as much as I could. There's, you know, as you guys know, this story is so deep. And uh, I was honestly kind of freaking myself out. I think I had nightmares for a couple of days leading up to it, knowing I was going to this place, which I usually don't have nightmares at all. And so it was really built up in my head. And so we found this place to park, and we're walking along the, um, this little walkway that goes alongside the main freeway. And it was still a beautiful California day. It was middle of the day, bright, sunny, comfortable. And I thought I was going to be really freaked out when I was standing up on top of the dam, which is just, you know, the, the, the cave where some of this activity took place, this cult activity took place, uh, was just on one side of the dam. And then you look across the ravine on the other side of the dam. That's where I was really thinking I was going to feel something, I guess, or maybe witness something. But uh, it was actually in, walking through this little park on the way to the dam I, you know, the friend I was with and I, we were chatting, we were lighthearted. We just suddenly grew very silent and got kind of small in our steps. And we didn't communicate this at all, but we were just kind of going on our way. And we, once we got to the other side of this park, which by all surface features looked like a nice little comfortable place, um, once we were finally on the dam, the place I thought I would freak out, I felt totally relaxed again. And it was only at that point that I n- note in hindsight that, wow, I was super uncomfortable moments ago. Now, I don't know if anything took place at this park, if there was some negative energy just clouding up this certain area. Uh, I really don't know at all, but it is worth noting, and I cannot verify the exact pinpoint, but in addition to cryptids, cult activity, uh, all sorts of other darkness. There's also a serial killer story attached what? to this location. <gasps> yes, again, just Man. Talk, talking about more and more darkness. So I would never move to Pasadena now because it sounds like it sounds like a terrifying place, it, and not just because it's where the Big Bang Theory takes well, place. Well, and because the, the little old lady there, you know, she, you gotta watch out for her. Hey, <laughs> but um, bump. <laughs> But anyway, in the mid to later 1950s, a number of children, unfortunately, I mean, it's going to be sad no matter what, but unfortunately, even more so, children went missing, and they seemed to really vanish. Uh, They could be with a group, and they get separated for a moment, and then they're just gone. Uh, A number of them went missing. Most of them were never found again, but one man did confess to a couple of the killings, and he was a guy named Mark Ray Edwards, and he was working with... Uh, the road system. He was a construction worker and he buried some of the bodies underneath the California freeways that were being installed. And one of the freeways is the freeway that goes alongside Devil's Gate Dam. Now I don't know if he, if the body is buried at that location, but I don't know, maybe that would explain the the weird vibe that we were feeling. Uh, But they definitely searched that area. They drained the Devil's Gate Reservoir looking for bodies. They did not find any of them. But this was definitely an area where children were disappearing from. So, I mean, this location is so scarred with darkness well beyond just uh, just trying to uh, bring about some demons and whatnot. <laughs> Did you guys find that the story of Jack Parsons and all this stuff, like, it just hasn't been around long enough or we just haven't heard long enough? Or did it, 
Did it only like really come to light when the, the strange angel and the sex and rockets were published in the books about his life? Because I, I remember reading as many books about the paranormal and even some Aleister Crowley stuff when I was younger and in high school in the 19, early 1990s and even beyond that. But I feel like it wasn't until the past few years that now everybody's like, oh yeah, Jack Parsons, weird dude. Like, do you guys remember hearing about him no. when you were younger at all? I sure don't. And I would think no, that I would have paid yeah. attention to that with my obsession with the uh, space program. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, Wendy, yeah. at, spa- at space camp, did you perform any kind of Crowleyan <laughs> ritual? <laughs> nice. <laughs> None that I uh, remember. I don't, I don't recall summoning Satan in any manner there. Yeah, that you know. Yeah, I was gonna say you don't know what every button you push <laughs> was doing. Obviously, it's it's all missing time. They just right. told you you were in the zero G simulator I mean, or we whatever. Did. We the truth. Read from a script during the mission, so you know maybe they were having us read some. Maybe so the lines had some secret uh, meaning yeah. that I don't know about. Sure. Oh, be sure to say. But, every- they talk yeah, about going to the moon. They talk about bringing the moon down in yeah. uh, the, the Jack Parsons uh, book about Babylon working. I think the first time I heard about. Uh, Jack Parsons was in Fortean Times, uh, that great magazine. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I don't have the issue anymore, but I, I think it was in the early 2000s. But yeah, I hadn't heard about him before that. Wow. And what makes me think that there could be a reason we're not hearing about it is the Scientologists. You know what I mean? <laughs> that could be. Well, think about that. Why would they want to make the founder of their religion sound like a dirtbag who stole another dude's girlfriend and was doing all these kind of satanic especially as you're trying to establish yourself as a more mainstream you're trying to get clear religion. you're trying to get clear and no, you but- find out that l ron did all the satanic stuff and stole some dude's girlfriend and all his money right and, and an organization that's trying to legitimize itself is not going to say well yeah he did all these like rituals trying to create a moon child in the 1940s but dianetics is completely science <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's and how I reconcile the two. And, and this is coming from a guy who read Dianetics and liked it. Truly so. much better than Krishna. <laughs> All right. So I got to say, it's been a lot of fun talking about Jack Parsons. Uh, Scott, thanks for joining us today. And to everybody out there, make sure you check out Strange Angel. Uh, if we had a CBS referral code, we'd give it to you right now <laughs> so we could make a couple of bucks on you. But we don't have to do that because you can always join our Patreon community. And it's even better where we can have conversations about things like this every month, like our uh, Patreon hangout that's happening tomorrow. Now, this week's rock and roll song about Jack Parsons and what went down is called Babylon Working. <laughs> for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. We love talking about this weird stuff and even more 
then we love talking about this weird stuff amongst each other. We love talking about it with our Patreon community. Yes. Actually, at the last hangout, we started talking about this and it became the uh, watchable of choice, the Strange Angel series. Mm -hmm. So it'll be fun seeing who watched it and what everybody's thoughts are on it when we hang out Wednesday, June 27th at 7 p.m. Central Time. So the people who are, we're hanging out with are, are on our Patreon community. And if you guys are interested in becoming part of the Patreon community, which helps the See You on the Other Side podcast work on new episodes, new songs, keeps the servers running, keeps the engine lubed, keeps the rockets fueled, uh, then you can check that out at othersidepodcast.com slash donate. We've got different things for each level of the Patreon. Oh! Sorry, I... I was graphic with my hands and I bumped. I really, I was, I'm so effusive about our Patreons that I bumped my popper stopper right off my microphone. <laughs> I saw it. So we have, we have different levels of Patreon uh, membership and Dr. Ned is at the level of Patreon sponsorship where he gets a shout out in every single episode. So thank for you, your Ned. sponsorship, thank you, Dr. Ned. We, we appreciate all you do uh, for the See You on the Other Side podcast, community, Sunspot, and the songs and all of that. So once again, sure we'll see everybody at the Patreon Hangout, and that is Wednesday, June 27th, 7 p.m. Central Time. If you want to get in on it and on a discussion about things like Strange Angel, uh, then make sure you check it out at othersidepodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for listening. If I'm going to take over the world, I'm going to do it with, like, with hidden style. Hey, your uh, your baking soda volcano's really sweet. I've got ball over here.